Baudrillard's Noble Anthropology, the image of symbolic exchange in political economy. Marx's critique of political economy has itself suffered a number of critiques in this century. Since the late 1960s, we have seen a number of such critiques in France, no doubt in partial reaction to the rise of a revitalized Marxism prior to 1968 and its subsequent decline in many intellectual circles. As a subject of analysis, discussions of political economy almost inevitably touch upon questions of an anthropological nature, this at time in their concern for a universal man, but at other times simply in their effort to contrast the interplay of economy and polity in a perspective of cross-cultural breadth and historical depth. Baudrillard's Le Miroir de la Production seeks to follow the latter route in its two-pronged criticism of dialectical materialism and political economy. Marx makes a radical critique of political economy, we are told, but he makes it still in the form of political economy. The anticipated response is thus no surprise. We must move to a radically different level beyond its critique to the definitive resolution of political economy. The argument thus develops substantially beyond Marxism and political economy to a discussion of what Baudrillard entitles symbolic exchange, a concept seemingly owing much to the social exchange emphasis of French sociology from Maus to Levi Strauss. But, as wielded by Baudrillard, the concept reveals itself as something in fact less systematic, less sociological, and considerably more radical in its opposition with the subsequently developed view of modern society. This is, as I will argue below, no doubt the concept's rhetorical function. But it is a function that achieves its goal of saving primitive society from the categories of modern political economy and Marxism, only at the rather dubious expense of an idealized primitivism and a denigrated modernity. It is the profundity of this sociological break, to parody Althusser's earlier vaunted epistemological break, that gives Baudrillard's criticism of contemporary political economy its force. But examination of the two major movements in Baudrillard's critique, the criticism of the categories of political economy and the assertion of the sociological distinctiveness of primitiveness, might suggest here, as elsewhere, one need be cautious with analytically acclaimed ruptures profonde. Productivity and value, disarticulating the metaphor. Productivity, Baudrillard asserts, is a concept that underlies Marxist discourse in the most varied of spheres. It thus provides a guiding metaphor for Telkel's notion of textual productivity, or for Freudian Marxism, Ichos productif, or even for the work of the unconscious in Deleuze's work. Just as the liberation of productive forces in Marxian analysis is equated with the liberation of man, these parallel discourses in turn see a liberation in the unfettering of their respective spheres of production. It is the name of an unalienated hyperproductivity, of a productive hyperspace that one will abolish the capitalist law of value. Capital develops productive forces, but it restricts them too. One must liberate them. The exchange of signifieds has always occulted the work of the signifier. Liberate the signifier. In such a direction does the theme of productivity lead, and Baudrillard quite rightfully faults this extension of a poorly understood metaphor to other fields of interpretation. But the unanalyzed productive paradigm further extends itself into other aspects of Marx's work. Something of it was extended into the analysis of classical political economy's notion of value, and it is to this cornerstone of Marxist economics that Baudrillard turns his particular attention. Classical political economy's notion of value, according to Marx, was incapable of distinguishing two distinct moments in the movement of goods, exchange value, and use value. Arising in the era of a booming capitalist market, political economy limited the notion of value to the exchange value of an item. Marx, on the contrary, sought to present the exchange value function as the relation of goods to their market of exchange. This but one moment in their larger history involving, in addition, their production and consumption. The exchange value of an item was also implicitly conceived of as somehow secondary to, more abstract than, the concrete acts of production and consumption, use value. It was only the growth of a capitalist market, Marx would argue, 
where qualitatively different goods became commodities comparable according to a common quantitative abstraction of exchange value, that the latter came to be viewed as the seeming essence of value. Marx was, in anthropological terms, concerned with the social conditions behind the emergence of a cultural category of understanding. But Baudrillard focuses on the presupposition underlying the argument on use value. Use value, the anterior, the concrete value, the human finality of the commodity in its direct rapport with its utility for a subject. Marx has performed a sleight of hand on a concept every bit as abstract as that of exchange value. Everywhere exchange value appears as if to be no more than abstraction, the abstract distortion of concrete production, concrete consumption, concrete signification. But it is the exchange value which brings use value into appearance as the latter's anthropological horizon. It is exchange value of labour power which brings use value into appearance, the originality and the concrete finality of the act of labour as its generic alibi. It is the logic of signifiers which produces the evidence of the reality of the signified and referent. Use value can no more emerge as interior to the exchange value of goods than can the reality of signification appear without the operation of the signifier. The analogy is telling. Both use value and exchange value, Baudrillard argues, are effects of a code derived equally from the political economy of capitalism. Both values in turn are absent from primitive symbolic exchange, an exchange of origins radically opposed to the exchange of capitalist economy. Baudrillard's argument is convincingly elegant. Marx stops short of his goal of a true critique of and beyond political economy. Marx confined within a limited intellectual configuration. Marx is misdirected in his emphasis on use value as those semioticians who emphasize the finality of an objective referentiality to the detriment of the signifiers that bring that referentiality into human understanding. But something in this much-probed can of worms still seems problematic. On closer look, one realizes that Baudrillard has played upon an ambiguity in Marx's analysis of the role of use value as a logical priority to exchange value. Marx was in fact concerned in his analysis with two interdependent social processes, two which Marx himself perhaps failed to sufficiently emphasize as non-identical. On the one hand, he traces the emergence of an ideological form, exchange value as concept, within a nascent capitalist society. But on the other hand, he is concerned with the background to these cultural categories, the historical processes which, in their objective development, created the social conditions favourable for a system of production for exchange value. While the two processes are quite dependent, their contingency is not identical. Marx's position was that exchange in primitive society was highly restricted, limited only to that surplus which remained after the productive and consumption needs of a population were met. In this view, primitive production was not primarily oriented towards the fetching of a value in an exchange. Production was for, at least more so than modern economy, the concrete use to which an item could be put. Only with increasing production and increasing circulation of goods did there emerge a single generalized system of exchange and quantitative exchange value, against which items could be compared and evaluated, and towards which production would increasingly orient itself. Thus, on the one hand, changes in social and economic conditions. On the other, changes in the categories that would, following the fact, describe those conditions, and, granted, play a vital role in their future change. Neither of these processes is independent of the other, but they cannot be confused, despite the fact that each seems to be described in one's talking of the coming to prominence of exchange value in capitalist society. Yet Baudrillard himself seems to fall victim to this ambiguity, faulting Marx for his denigration of exchange value, yet speaking only to the adequacy of the contra concept of use value as a supposed, in Marx's view, concrete anteriority. But one sees that this concrete is itself an abuse of sense. It appears to oppose itself with the abstract at the interior of the fork. In fact, it is the fork itself that establishes the abstraction. Just as exchange value is, as concept, linked with an abstract sphere of quantification and evaluation, so too is use value, again viewed as concept, of an abstract nature, posing as it does, the comparability of all human practice in terms of production and work. 
we are led to believe that both concepts are the abstract effects of a code founded in modern political economy. Granting that both the concept of use and exchange value are abstractions, Baudrillard nevertheless seems to have neglected half of Marx's concern. Marx is not only interested in an abstract structural code which adequately describes the structural categories of capitalism. He sought in addition to explain the social and economic processes that allowed for the emergence of such a code, and in this process, as Marx describes it, there was indeed a historical anteriority, a sociological development of greater, or rather earlier, prominence. That was the real-world production of items for their use. Unfortunately, Baudrillard leaves the problem of social transformation of economic processes in the margins of his own analysis, thus failing to criticise Marx where he could have best in the anthropology of primitive exchange. Anthropology is now aware, from ethnographic studies, that exchange is not something that occurs only after all immediate needs have been met by primitive producers. As Mauss argued long ago, but perhaps himself with insufficient functional consideration, Exchange is crucial to the primitive social fabric, although this varies in extent and importance from society to society. Also in contrast with Marx's anthropology, primitive societies have been found to have, in some instances, a system of circulation in which goods are exchanged according to fixed relative values, exchange values. But it is rare that exchange operate according to and for the purpose of a single quantitative value nor do activities of an economic nature appear as independent of religious, kin, and other social considerations. In a sense, then, Marx was more correct than Baudrillard is aware. The predominance of production for a single-term exchange value has come into real prominence only with the development of a modern market, with its system of large-scale production and exchange, pricing in terms of a quantity of money, and its growing incorporation of need satisfaction into a more purely economic realm. It is this process that Marx in part sought to explain in historical terms and Baudrillard has ignored in favour of a more purely structural analysis. As will be argued below, a similar emphasis of categories to the detriment of larger on-the-ground developments imposes severe limitations on the point that emerges as Baudrillard's foil to the evaluation of political economy, symbolic exchange. Symbolic exchange. Quote, symbolic circulation is primordial. That which acquires a functional use is removed from this sphere. Eventually the removal is nil, and everything is consumed symbolically. There remains nothing, because survival is not a principle. We have made it a principle. For primitives, to eat, to drink, to live, are all firstly acts which are exchanged. If they cannot be exchanged, they don't take place. Every man has a right to create his own savage for his own purposes. Perhaps every man does, but to demonstrate that such a constructed savage corresponds to Australian Aborigines, African tribesmen, or Brazilian Indians is another matter altogether. End quote. Clifford Geertz, The Cerebral Savage, on the work of Claude Levi Strauss, 1973. Among critical thinkers, those in an intellectual tradition seeking a social image, an alternative beyond existing social configurations. The image of primitives has exercised a sometimes hypnotic fascination. But what is distant in time and social space is subject to interpretive confusion, subject to both visionary hope and fantasy. This situation does not elude anthropologists either, as Geertz has indicated. Know what he thinks a savage is, and you have the key to his work. You know what he thinks he himself is, and, knowing what he thinks he himself is, you know in general what sort of thing he is going to say about whatever tribe he happens to be studying. All ethnography is part philosophy, and a good deal of the rest is confession. Baudrillard achieves his definitive resolution of political economy through the operator of symbolic exchange, thought to be the dominant mode of all operation in primitive society. One recalls Rousseau in this looking back on a primitive society juxtaposed in confrontation with modern, a difference of primitives as an element of rupture and subversion. The force of declaration of this confrontation alerts one to its severity, and thus one is not surprised to learn that primitive man does not know necessity 
that law which takes effect only with the objectification of nature. This objectification takes its definitive form with the political economy of capitalism. It is, moreover, no more than the philosophical expression of scarcity, which we know emanates from the market economy. Or, in a similar vein, scarcity is not a given dimension of economy, but is produced and reproduced by economic exchange, opposed to primitive exchange, which knows absolutely nothing of the law of nature. All concepts drawn from economic analysis are thus inappropriate for the understanding of primitive society. No, these are not producers, no. There are no means of production, nor objective labour, controlled or uncontrolled. No, these are not needs and their satisfaction which orient them. In a sense here, Baudrillard is arguing toward a very worthwhile point. Primitive economy is always linked to kinship, ritual, the larger environment. But to insist, as Baudrillard does, that the very concept of economy be disregarded for the real finality of primitive society, symbolic exchange, is to fall victim to the same confusion over categories of interpretation, in this case, those native to primitive culture, that confounded the use-value-exchange-value discussion. One can recognise the embeddedness of economy in various spheres of primitive society, and recognise further native non-distinction of a strictly economic sphere, yet still employ such terms as economy and production in the observer-based analysis of primitive society. That is, as long as the search for a sociologic is not claimed to be identical with a phenomenological concern for native understanding, surely Baudrillard himself should have realised that his concept of symbolic exchange falls victim to his own argument. Few natives would recognise in this concept the central concern and manner of functioning of their own society. Yet, as an analytical tool, such a concept might be useful in an observer-based discourse of explanation. Thus, when Baudrillard denies any concern among primitives for survival, scarcity, production, objective labour, necessity, or the unconscious, he is at best confused, and sometimes quite wrong. The starving Tikopia of Polynesia, who increasingly restricted the breadth of their social exchange outside minimal kin units in the face of an island-wide famine of epidemic proportions, might have been surprised to learn of the central principle of their, like all primitive, society. Survival is not a principle. We have made it a principle. For primitives, to eat, to drink, to live, are all firstly acts which are exchanged. If they cannot be exchanged, they don't take place. This rather cavalier generalisation, unsupported by any reference of Baudrillard's to ethnographic literature, would, to say the least, leave most anthropologists perplexed, if not dumbfounded. But it follows, we will see, from Baudrillard's earlier arguments concerning the inapplicability of any economic or politic economic categories to primitive society due to their supposed origin in capitalist economy. What is at issue here, according to Baudrillard, is in fact something considerably larger, it is the attempt to invest the capitalist, pre-capitalist dichotomy with all the force of a veritable sociological rupture. It is the notion of symbolic exchange that is used to operate this opposition. In primitive exchange, gift, the status of circulating goods is close to that of language. They are neither produced nor consumed as values. Their function is the incessant articulation of exchange. A Levi-Straussian symphony is thus taken one step further from the simple analysis of the form of exchange, only giving secondary, if any, consideration to its specific role, to an explicit relegation of the role or structural function of primitive exchange to a position of non-importance. These are not values that circulate. Primitive exchange cannot be assimilated to any larger purpose of survival, or alliance, status, power, or political integration. Nor is there any question of investissement, personal intrigue, and économie libidinale. Primitive symbolic exchange cannot operate as a whole, even a use value, for this would relegate the key term of Baudrillard's symbolic opposition to a status akin to that of political economy. Primitive exchange is, and must remain, non-recuperable to any system of value in any sense other than exchange itself. Their function is the incessant articulation of exchange,
This rather blinded view of symbolism and exchange in primitive society reaches its climax in Baudrillard's reinterpretation of the master-slave relation of such importance to Hegel and Marx. Evidently, both thinkers failed to extend their analysis beyond, again, the metaphorical terms of political economy. There exists between the two a relation of reciprocity, in the sense of an obligation, a structure of exchange and obligation where the specification of the terms of the exchange as autonomous subjects, where that partition of the contract, economic or psychological, which we know is not yet given. We need not be bothered by such instances as the extinction of quacutal slaves in the status competition of high-status potlatches, for Baudrillard reassures us. It is only at the level of commerce in slaves, that is to say when slavery is taken by a commercial market, that the master disposes of the slave to the point of being able to alienate him like a commodity. Again, while the situation of slaves may have degenerated considerably with the expansion of slave marketing, Baudrillard's unsubstantiated claim sits rather poorly with much of our ethnographic data on pre-capitalist societies. The symbolic of which Baudrillard speaks thus has little to do with contemporary anthropology's notion of symbolism, where symbolic processes are seen to be central to all human culture since at least the time of Neanderthal, and some would argue all the way back to Australopithecines, and certainly still in the most contemporary of societies. But Baudrillard's symbolism, and exchange, is concerned with something rather different, related primarily to his own unabashed effort to create an opposition of unbridgeable proportions between capitalist society and a primitive, projected other. Only in this light can one understand the rather ethnographically fantastic claims that, for example, no other culture than ours has produced that systematic distinction between black and white. Or similarly, no other culture than ours has produced that systematic abstraction where all the elements of symbolic exchange between the sexes have been liquidated for the profit of a binary functionality. On the one hand, them, the mass of diverse human cultures throughout the whole span of human evolution, non-racist, at least not as much, non-sexist, similarly, on the other, us. One can perhaps empathise with any sense of concern that may have motivated these absurdities, but there is an overwhelming ethnographic, literary, and historical body of literature that would deny them. No, Baudrillard is not concerned with ethnographic particulars. He desires simply to affirm a now-lost symbolism of unlimited exchange, festive and free volatilization of the forces of the body, a playing with death, the act of desire. This is not a symbolism at the intersect of sociological, cultural parameters and the formation of subjectivity, not a symbolic system that serves as cultural codage where other species employ a more restricted biological one. Baudrillard's is a symbolism of la perte, of the gift of sacrifice, as perhaps with other French writers that see in primitive society the immediate, unmediated, non-rational, non-recuperable operation of loss. Baudrillard seeks in symbolic exchange a use value of phantasm an imaginary other that achieves both its form and expressive force in the radicalness of its difference with a depressing modernity. This comes into clear view when we turn from the image of primitivity to that of modern capitalism. With monopoly capitalism, the same mutation takes place as in the sphere of the sign. The final reference of products, their use value, in effect disappears. Needs lose all autonomy. They are coded. Consumption no longer has its own value of pleasure. It is placed under the constraint of an absolute finality, that of production. This, by contrast, is no longer assigned any finality other than itself. The earlier discussed analysis of use value and exchange value now comes in to clearer focus. That use value is always and everywhere as tied to a system of political economy as is the notion of exchange value is not simply an error of Marxist analysis. It is a rhetorical necessity. If not so viewed, Marxist analysis risks bridging the unbearable opposition between primitive and modern, subverting the we-other binarism that the concept of symbolic exchange affirms. The point of reviewing all this is not to reintegrate the primitive into our own ideological system as a rather narrow-minded entrepreneur akin to our own classical capitalist. 
somewhat more bound by tradition, stupider. This response would do an injustice to the complexity of societies and personalities that we find in our overgeneralized category of primitive society. It would also rather oversimplify our own image of modern man and woman. Yes, even including those most classic of capitalists. The definitive resolution of categories of political economy might minimally involve a revaluation of our own model of economic behavior. We might be surprised to find that, on a subjective and social level, the motivations of most economic agents in modern society are considerably more diffuse and complicated than the single term maximization we attribute them. If the price of salvaging our view of the primitive is thus a denigrated modernity coupled with an idealized savage, the price is too high. As Geert said above, every man has the right to create his own savage, and perhaps every man does. To this might be added that every man has the right to create his own image of modernity, and that we all most certainly do. But to try to convince others of these views takes more than a keen sense of moral outrage. Contrary to what Baudrillard may think, there is for many people still a good deal of magic in living, moments of pleasure and social exchange, sacrifice and suffering, contradiction. No, we have not lost the capacity for symbolism, nor for an exchange motivated by other than single-term economic consideration. Nor have we lost an autonomy in the sphere of personal needs, because such an autonomy of the personal from the social most assuredly has never existed. But to repeat, this is not to affirm the half of Baudrillard's opposition dealing with capitalism. It is to suggest that the opposition itself is ill-founded. The realm of personal social need, satisfaction, has increasingly been tied to the operation of a market. And this has been accompanied by an expansion of socially defined wants and the market geared to their continued growth. All of us in Western society are both victims and beneficiary of the system, one which indeed most definitely involves a political economy of polity and benefits. This system in turn has had a most dramatic effect on other world cultures increasingly linked to events originating in the West. In this, many people would see an event of tragic proportions. A romanticized symbolic does not really speak to this problem. The demand that it never be given without being rendered, never gained without being lost, never produced without being destroyed, never spoken without being responded to. Such an image presents a perhaps admirable notion of reciprocity, but one that never operated anywhere simply for the sake of its own poetry. To many people in the present world, such words may offer considerably less consolation than would a good helping of cake. There is one final question in all this, a sociological one. Is it just coincidence that such a vision of idealized primitiveness and debased modernity occurs in a period of considerable social and political unease in Europe, a period when the platitudes of both power and opposition seem to have fallen considerably short of their hoped-for program. Something seems to be called for in such a period, and no doubt Baudrillard's was one response. But one would hope for something other than a despairing regard en arrière, something simpler, more social, and perhaps less dramatic than a definitive resolution.